Good evening. Um, as he said, I'm Helen Kennedy, head of the School of Media, and very pleased to be here to welcome you all and to introduce this evening's inaugural lecture from Janet Anderson, Professor of Digital Humanities. Janet is a doctor in the history of mathematics. Um, she is a master of microwaves and modern optics. Didn't even know that was a thing. And she is also a mathematics graduate. She's also not happy with the glamour of all of those awards. Recently, well, sort of recently, completed a BA in French for which she achieved a first class. I mention this range of qualifications because I wanted to particularly highlight and celebrate Professor Anderson's status as what I'd like to call a modern day female Leonardo or Leonarda. Um, embodying expert skills that traverse, transcend and challenge disciplinary boundaries with a particular gift for translating academic priorities into real world contexts, working with scientists, artists, archivists, technicians, archeologists in collaborations with a common mission. Her distinguished career has led her to significant advisory positions, not just here in the UK, where she's currently in her second term as Arts and Humanities Research Council peer reviewer, but also internationally with her very high profile work, as for instance, the current work as international reviewer for the Ricks Bankens Jubilums Fund, um, Swington's leading grant-making foundation in the humanities and social sciences. Apologies to anyone for the damage I just did to that bit of Swedish. Um, she's worked in the field of digital heritage preservation for over 20 years, displaying a passionate commitment to retaining our collective histories for our future generations, a major project, making use of popular techniques such as games, digital art, and 3D modeling of archaeological sites to capture and captivate current and future audiences, visitors, and researchers creating that um, yeah, virtual arc of the future, which um, we'll come on to. Professor Anderson's work is leading the field of the in the development of heritage preservation tools and techniques. Her work will far outlive all of us in the room. Um, not many people can say that of their contributions. She's also the scientific con coordinator for the highly celebrated EARC project, such a beautiful title, which is, stands for the European Archival Records and Knowledge Preservation Project, but has that sense of preservation and saving things that might otherwise be lost to the elements. A project that brings together more than 13 European countries in an exemplary and potentially threatened, in the context of Brexit, kind of collaboration which has broken new international ground in the development of tools for tackling a range of problems associated with independent record-keeping technologies, systems, and practices. EARC aims to impact the development of internationally accessible archives through the provision of technical specifications and tools, many of which are open source and built for collaboration and improvement by the, both the, the existing partnership and others to come after, and the development of an integrated archiving infrastructure and the d demonstration of improved availability, access, and use, and the rigorous analysis of aggregated sets of archival data. An amazing project. It was designated as the European Showcase Project and given the very highest mark and excellent at their, at their final review. The UK National Archives are using EARC as a case study in their, at their trusted archives section in their brochure for the launch of their archives, Unlocked opened by Matt Hancock, the Minister for Digital. This ER work now is in the process of being transformed into the e-archiving building block for the Connecting Europe facility which underpins the digital single market. An amazing undertaking. Um, I wish you a very warm welcome to our most distinguished professor, Janet Anderson, for an inaugural talk entitled The Secret Life of Digital Archives. Thank you. Thank you, and a very warm welcome to everybody. <clears throat> now, the astute among you will, know that, will notice that before May, I had a different name. Mm -hmm. I was announced as Janet Delve. Now, you'll have to wait till the end of the lecture to see what happened and why I am Janet Anderson. Some of you will already know the answer. Some of you won't. Oh, glasses, it would help if I started with my glasses up. So, Helen has admirably, thank you very much, Helen, for the introduction, the very kind introduction. You have admirably sub, summed up what I've been doing over the last 20 years. It makes me tired just to listen to, <laughs> to, listen to that. Um, how on earth have I managed to do those, that variety of things? Well, that's what I intend to talk to you about this evening. I'm going to tell you about my research journey there and back again. 
like Bilbo Baggins. Starting with digital humanities, what is it? When I tell people that I'm a professor of digital humanities, they say, oh yes. It's not something that they can immediately recognize like history or mathematics. Then I'll have a look at how I went to go from the science to the humanities and back again, and on to dig digital preservation and the secret life of digital archives. So the digital humanities, this is a very broad church. Um, we tend to think of the, the internet of things, the um, smart cities, the social effects of living in a digital world. What does this mean for us? There's, I was at a, um, a digital humanities conference last year and there were a thousand people there. It was an international conference. And these discussions were very wide ranging. Now my particular interest is in the very practical, very practical little corner of this. And that's what I will be talking to you about this evening. And I found a definition, it's not the best definition, it's not a perfect definition, but it's a definition from Stanford University. And it serves my purpose just to tell you what I think this subject is about and what interests me particularly. So the digital humanities sits, sit at the crossroads of computer science and the humanities. Since the 1980s, a wide range of computational tools have enabled humanities scholars to conduct research at a scale once thought impossible. Digital humanities foster collaboration and traverse disciplines and methodological orientations with projects to digitize archival materials for posterity, to map the exchange and transmission of ideas in history, and to study the evolution of common words over the centuries. Now, I've emphasized the things that I'm particularly interested in, tools actually producing tools, so not, not the discussion, that's not particularly my, my aim, it's actually producing things that people desperately need. Traversing disciplines, you've got some idea of, of my background from Helen's introduction and you'll see more of it in a minute. Different methodologies, how can we take something from one subject and use it in another? Archival materials, well, working with archives is something that's very important to me. Working with historians and others. Now, over my research career, a bit of cultural context, the discussion about the difference between the science and the humanities. The essay in 1956, from C.P. Snow is something that after I finished my maths degree and I started thinking about other things, really made a, an impression on me. So when I started to look at the history of maths, which I'll talk about uh, presently, this, this essay from C.P. Snow is something that I found uh, challenging and illuminating. He talked about the huge chasm between the arts and the, science, the sciences. He said that science, scientists do not read Shakespeare, a really uh, a terrible thing to level at poor scientists. But in revenge, literary intellectuals do not understand the second law of thermodynamics. Now, I'm afraid I did do this for physics A level, but I had to go back and remind myself what it actually talks about. And it's entropy. What's entropy? We all hear the word entropy, and it's the number of mic microscopic configurations. These remain constant if you've got a system that's uh, a kind of a, an isolated system. Right, so if nothing else, you can go away this evening and you will know what the second law of thermodynamics is. So if you come from a, an arts background, you can have a feather in your cap. So the duality of arts and humanities, the clash, that is the 50s. Now, I am a 50s girl. Um, I went to Stan Grammar School for Girls up in the north of England near, uh, near Manchester. I did a, a wide range of O-levels, as it was in those days. I did not do history. Um, history was all about telling stories before O-level and didn't capture my imagination and I didn't do geography either. Sorry, Richard. 
When I came to do uh, A-levels, I was the only person that did further mathematics. I did double maths and physics. Now, I had a meeting, oh, not a meeting, a reunion with my school friends a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying what absolutely excellent teachers they had uh, for O-level, history O-level, and A-level, and how that really set them up for their careers in the arts. Um, I'm very grateful for my education, but if I, if I were to say that I begged to be able to be sent to the boys' school, you perhaps have an idea that the maths teaching that I got um, it could have been better. Very grateful for it. But there we are. I was not able at A-level to do a range of subjects. I couldn't do English, French, and maths, as some of my children did. It was you did the sciences or you did the arts. So I'm back again to the dichotomy between the arts and the sciences. Now, I loved French, and I always wanted to learn Latin. I will one day learn Latin, but I couldn't do it then. I had a clash. I was going to do uh, O-level Latin, and there was a clash. You'll see why this is important a little bit later. Well, I was very happy. I was able to go and do mathematics at UCL, thoroughly enjoyed it, and then went on to do electrical engineering. I loved the pure maths, and I loved the physics side of maths. I also did uh, mechanics. Uh, in my A-level, so there were always ladders against laws, uh, against walls. Uh, every exam question had a, a ladder leaning against the law and uh, a wall and find the, uh, find the forces. I then went on to do something very strange, the history of mathematics. Now, why did I end up doing the history of mathematics? I will tell you presently. And then something extremely strange that you wouldn't perhaps know what, what it is, source-oriented data processing. So that's my education. How did I get to do those strange things? So this is my journey from science to the humanities. When my family was small, I started working at King Alfred's College in Winchester. I started off as a computer programmer, but my mathematics degree was spotted at interview, and I was soon inveigled into teaching mathematics. I have to say that I absolutely adored it. I taught on what was the B ed, and my very first lecture, I was just propelled into a room and asked to look after students for three and a half hours. I have no idea how I managed that, but I really, really loved it, and I never looked back. That was me. I was an academic from then onwards. I was asked to teach the history of mathematics. Now, I didn't know that mathematics had a, his, had a, had a history. Now, this is very strange. If you do medicine or many subjects, you're automatically told about their history. If you do English, you know the history of the English language, what's happened to it. If you do maths, you're given lots of equations and, and, and wonderful things to solve, which are very exciting. But you're not told how the subject developed. You're not told who did it, why, what mistakes they made, what's interesting about it. Well, I was asked to teach at King Alfred's. I was asked to teach the history of mathematics, and that was it. I was absolutely hooked on this subject. It's fascinating. And Many of the students who did that course with me also got hooked, um, which is very exciting and what we look for in education. I also taught computing to history students and English students. So this is things like uh, Access, um, Microsoft Access database, spreadsheets, um, WordPerfect, so this introduced me to working with um, historians, other folk in the humanities. So that was a very good, um, very good experience working with uh, across disciplines. I was so excited about the history of mathematics that I decided to do a PhD in it. What possessed me? I don't know. So I had three small children a full-time job by that stage. I had stopped being a computer programmer and gone into being a full-time lecturer. 
and then I did a part-time PhD. Difficult, very difficult, but I did it. It took me several years, but very exciting. Now, I looked at a 19th century journal called the Educational Times, a journal of science, education, and literature. And inside that journal, there was a little section of mathematical problems, problems and solutions. And I analyzed these problems and solutions. It turned out that there were many famous mathematicians that put problems and solutions in there. These were people who couldn't, or many of them, couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge because they were non-conformists. So there's uh, James Joseph Sylvester, uh, a Jewish uh, mathematician. There was uh, Augustus de Morgan from University College London, who was a non-conformist. And so they were using this little uh, mathematical department, it was called, to solve problems. And new subjects arose. This was the, the topic of my, uh, of my PhD. In order to analyze that, I was recommended to use databases. I didn't know what a database was at that stage. This was before I was uh, teaching it to historians. So I learnt. Now, you'll all have seen databases. You'll all have seen rows and columns and what have you, um, tables. We have databases everywhere. We have, um, we have them on the web. We have them in um, libraries. They are so ubiquitous these days. Now, what I particularly like is data modeling. And in order to do a, a good data model, you have to look at each of these little things here. So each of these, each of these little tiny elements, you have to work out how do they relate to each other. And this is a topic when I eventually came to teach it that I would never do off the top of my head because you can go wrong extremely quickly doing this. Students that I used to teach this to would talk about their torment because of the uh, abyss uh, of, of modeling, the, uh, the chaos uh, and the, the modeling abyss. They really found it difficult. It was something I particularly liked, I think because of my mathematics, my pure mathematics background. I've always really, really enjoyed this whole aspect of modeling. This took me on to learning about large databases. And I say this, data warehousing is an area that I've looked at for 20 years with my good colleague, Professor Richard Healy, who's here with us today. It's a very complicated area, and this is the only slide I have on it. Um, so I can't do it justice. Whenever you use something like Google or Amazon, <clears throat> they have an absolutely massive kind of database. Uh, it's not exactly like a database, it's like a mega database called a data warehouse, and they are built for analysis. I learned about these, and uh, Richard and I have been researching in this area for many, many years, and it's a very, very rich, very complicated area, but very rich and very interesting. Now, this is a slide that I did with a colleague, um, Dr. Mark Allen, at the University of Winchester, and this was imagining how we would model um, the Doomsday Book. So all, so if you took the, do the Doomsday material from all the different areas in the country where there are Doomsday Books covered and put it into one big data warehouse, this is what it would look like, or potentially what it could look like. Now, the difference is databases, you've got lots and lots and lots of little, um, little tables, hard to join together, hard to analyze, hard to query. A data warehouse traditionally has this kind of simple star shape. Now, that is a very, very crude discussion but it gives you an idea of an area that is very, very interesting. And it's the, this whole modeling area that has captured me over the years. I also got to, uh, got to work with people from the Association for History and Computing. So this is um, historians, and it was all historians. I was the only one 
from the science background. Everybody was a historian. So in 1996, when I gave a paper in Moscow at Moscow State University, everybody knew Russian. They all knew Russian history, and I felt completely ignorant there. Now, thankfully, I've caught up a bit now, um, but it was very, it was very difficult being the only one from the kind of the science background. It did stand me in good stead, however. Uh, someone who is now at the top of their profession stood up and talked about Newtonian de determinism and how we don't need that anymore because we've got chaos theory. Well, that's not true. And I did uh, understand that. So I was able to use a particular database <clears throat> called Clio, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And at King Alfred's College, just popping back there, I worked on something called the Winchester Project. So Clio, this was developed by Professor Manfred Taller at the University of Cologne. <clears throat> it was developed in the early 90s, and it was an incredible piece of software, absolutely incredible. You could uh, develop your database uh, in a very fluid way. So here we have these rigid little tables, and for any of you that have ever studied databases, there are mathematical laws behind those little tables. There are rigid rules, there are terrible things called normal forms that to do this properly, you have to follow. They get quite difficult quite quickly. Now, this Clio was written by a historian for historians. The exciting thing was the instructions in the book were written in Latin because all historians speak Latin, don't they? Well, as I mentioned before, I hadn't spoken, I hadn't learnt Latin, and so I couldn't, I couldn't uh, use those. Thankfully, there were English versions as well, so I did manage. But this was an astonishing piece of software, absolutely astonishing, and Manfred Teller has been a beacon for me for many, many years an incredible, um, incredible academic and lovely person. So this database system, you could devise uh, your, own, uh, your own model, so you could take a document and then you could devise a database that had the same structure as, as your document, which is superb. And then you could display um, maps, images, logarithmic images, this was in the early 90s, years ahead of its time, in my opinion. Absolutely wonderful. And the Winchester Project, I worked on the Winchester Project, um, and I taught the PhD students how to use Clio, this Clio system. So I learned how to use it, I used it for my own PhD, and then I taught others how to use it. And the Winchester Project went from uh, it's tracing the property uh, history of Winchester, Winchester tenements, from 1550 to the present day. This was led by Professor Tom Beaumont James, and uh, Dr. Mark Allen worked on this, uh, Dr. Mike May, and others. We looked at leases, we looked at properties in the high street, wills, inventories, we put all that data together to create a rich picture of Winchester. And there are several PhDs in the history department of what is now the University of Winchester in this area. So a very, very interesting project. Back in the day, uh, when I used to work there, my idea was to have a data warehouse, which I'd learnt about many years ago. We still haven't got one, but it was the, that was the idea. It would have been perfect. I mentioned data warehouses a little while ago. People these days talk about big data, and that has caught everybody's imagination. Uh, and I'm glad of that, that's very useful. At least when I talk about data warehouses, they kind of know what sort of area I'm working in. Lots of people working in big data work with social media, and that is extremely interesting. Uh, I won't go on to tangents about politics, but uh, that is a very interesting area. But there's a whole area that we could go into looking at a town or a city 
putting together all the material about it over time and coming up with a rich picture. So that's the kind of thing that I would like to do with big data. So that's history and computing. Having finished my PhD in the history of, of mathematics, I then went on to teaching and developing courses in history, the history of computing. This, again, is a wonderful vein. Nobody ever talks about the history of computing, or they didn't uh, years ago. It's another one of those subjects where people just don't routinely look at the history, despite the interest behind it. I found it a wonderful course to teach. You come across people like Babbage, Charles Babbage, and Ada Lovelace. If any of you have watched the recent series of Victoria on television, you'll see Queen Victoria and Prince Albert talking to Babbage and, uh, and Ada Lovelace, and the discussions that they have are very illuminating. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating era, um, and the difference engine, the analytical engine that Babbage created, fascinating things. This led to visits to history of computing museums like the Science Museum and the uh, Bletchley Park. And those of you that remember the other Professor Anderson's talk, um, that's where that, that area came from. Turing 2004, oh, Colossus first. Some of you might recognize the picture in the background as being the Colossus uh, at Bletchley Park, the uh, Colossus machine, the decryption machine, one of the first computers. Alan Matheson Turing, the 2004 conference we had. Nobody was interested in Turing at that stage. We tried, a group of us tried to get, not quite nobody, we tried to get um, money together for a statue of Turing. Big industry wasn't interested. It was very difficult to get funds for this statue. Now, I'm very pleased recently that Google has become very interested in Turing, but I wish that more people had been interested back in 2004, which was 50 years after his death. So, history of computing, absolutely fascinating subject. Having looked at, at Turing and having looked at um, others like Max Newman, the, I spent a, quite a lot of time looking at the Lions Electronic Office, the Leo computer. And Dan Saber said it was the British thirst for a constant supply of tea and cakes that gave the world its first business computer. Now, in the 1950s, this particular computer was used to help with tea blending. Now, as a good northerner, I find this an absolutely fascinating area uh, and have a whole talk on this. Uh, it's a, a fascinating area of research. This very, very early computer and some very early computer programming were used in decision, uh, decision making, decision support, to work out the various bits of tea, the various mixes and blends, all in different places. There were, some of them were brought by um, narrowboats, some of them were brought by, uh, brought, um, by train and put in different warehouses. And the computer program that was written worked out what was the best, the most economical way of mixing that tea together in order uh, to be most profitable. So that, that forecasting back in the 1950s, uh, absolutely marvelous. So my interest in data warehousing and analysis and uh, blends very well with my interest in the history of computing where you're looking at decision support for blending tea. And what could be more exciting than blending tea? Very, very important. So, history of mathematics, history of computing, these are things that I researched and taught over time.
that led me to studying French. I mentioned that when I was at school, I absolutely adored French, but wasn't able to, keep, uh, to study it any further. I kept it up as best I could. Um, I did Institute of Linguists and various, various things, but I got to the stage where I couldn't do any more without doing a degree. So um, I was a full-time lecturer, um, researching, and I did a part-time French degree um, at the University of Southampton. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Along the way, I happened in, it must be 1989, to watch Abel Gance's film of Napoleon, which was expertly re restored by Kevin Brownlow, an absolute masterpiece. I was so excited. Uh, it's an old black and white film. For those of you that are film buffs, it used techniques that are rarely seen today. It was an amazing film. And it was, uh, it was on Channel 4, I think, um, for the bicentenary of the revolution. I happened to be baby babysitting. I happened to see it. Well, that was me gone. I've been researching Napoleon ever since. I had to know when I got to the end of that film what happened to Napoleon, and I've never stopped. So, having done my French degree, I was then working on the history of, uh, history of maths, history of computing. I started working, by this stage I was at uh, Portsmouth University, and I started collaborating with folk in the history department and the French department, and that ended up with me doing some French teaching. And I was actually able to give a lecture on Napoleon, as well as teaching on French culture and French language. And I, again, absolutely adored that. So that's taken me from mathematics, a history of mathematics, um, masters in microwave. Um, I omitted to mention that I worked for Marconi uh, working on developing radar, um, through to history of computing. So I've gone from science to the humanities. And now I ended up, uh, my French teaching, that took me, I did some uh, Erasmus exchanges where I taught on the history of computing, history of uh, mathematics. And that ended up with me doing some um, meeting up with some folk and taking part in a project on digital preservation. So, we come on now to this part of my talk, so the digital preservation, the challenge. So the challenge here is to take all kinds of digital material and safely keep them in an archive so that people can access them. And this slide is courtesy of my good colleague, Karin Bradenberg, from the Swedish National Archives. The KEEP project is something uh, worked on in 2009. And the history of computing was very important because we were looking at using emulation to help preserve digital material. So knowing about old computers, history of computers, was very important. With emulation, what you're doing is taking a current, computer, a current computer, putting software on it to make it look like it's an older computer. So that's emulation in a nutshell. So you need to know all about those older computers. So an obscure subject like the history of computing was actually useful, uh, and we were involved in this uh, project. They were trying to preserve computer games because they're one of the most complicated things to preserve. And if you can preserve those, you can preserve, well, not quite anything, but almost. And also, people preserving computer games built a lot of emulators. This project involved national libraries, the French, German, and Dutch. And I particularly worked on metadata, which I'll explain in a minute, data modeling, um, I've mentioned my interest in that area, and developed something called the Totem Technical Registry. Metadata. This is data about data. Now, we all know about, for example, a library book. The metadata to do with a library book 
is the title, the author. That is metadata. We can cope with that. This is an illustration that I adore. This is a three lead pigs. They have come over. They, were, they are Roman lead pigs. And the lovely thing about them is that they contain metadata. So here it says Vespasian. They belonged to the emperor Vespasian. And on these pigs are every single bit of information that you need to know about this lead pig. Because they were precious. So you, these would say which ship they were on, who was um, the captain of the ship, who was, the, who was leading the, uh, the Roman legions, etc. How many were in a consignment of pigs and what number that was. So everything you could know about that lead pig is actually on it, which is just wonderful. Now, wouldn't it be great if everything were like that and we could find out everything we needed to know? If you think about some poor person in a library or in an archive, they've perhaps been given a disc and there's something on the disc. What is it? What did it run on? How do we know? So let's take an example. Here's a computer game. What do we know about it? Well, thankfully, on this computer, on this computer disc um, game, there is some information. So we've got lots of nice, helpful information here. We've got CD-ROM drive. Ah, oh, already, Windows 98. Is anybody still using Windows 95, 98? Oh, it's already looking a bit outdated, and we only did this a short while ago. But it does at least tell you some specifications, some technical specifications. But how do they all fit together? Now, this is where my background in data modeling came to the fore, and I was able to put together this proper data model, which tells us how these things all work together. I don't expect you to be able to read or understand this, but there we go, it works. And this model was translated into a database, which we are working on together with um, many folk. We're currently working with the UNESCO Persist project, where they're particularly looking at software heritage. Um, Professor Natasha Millich Frailing is someone that we're working closely with from the University of Nottingham. We're working with uh, the Software Heritage Group from INRIA in Paris. And the whole subject of persistent identifiers. So if you've got something and you need a piece of software, you need a unique identifier for that so software as well as for any object. So the Thor project, we've been working closely with um, Dr. Adam Farquhar and Dr. Angela Dappert from the um, British Library on this subject. It's not just software we need to know about. We need to know about hardware as well. And all the work that we did, um, so the schemas, models, databases, all in this totem book that we did, which is the first of its kind to actually address this area. Hardware preservation, I loved, so we need to know about the actual machines, what machines did these things run on. There's lots of work being done at various computer history museums, and I love the, this picture from Bletchley Park where you've got Colossus meeting Game Boy, which covers um, some of the areas of interest uh, for me. This led to another project with the British Library and other partners, the preservation of complex objects, where we had three symposia to look at how to preserve digital art, how to preserve computer games, and archaeological simulations and visualizations. Now, there are three lovely free ebooks that we created, and they're there on the web. Nobody ever used them. Um, it's very strange in a digital age. 
Universities don't like them because they're free ebooks, so they don't rate them. Um, people don't seem to want to download them, even though they've got lovely illustrations. So we were persuaded to make a book, which we did, an edited volume, published by Facet, which um, I, I got a phone call uh, to be interviewed by someone in, Tess, in uh, Austin, Texas, um, because we were famous because of this book. Very exciting. So digital art, huge and vastly interesting subject. So if you want to know about that, there's a free ebook all about it or another one there. 3D simulations in visualizations. So when you go to a museum, you perhaps see an object and then together with it, you'll find a 3D simulation. Preserving that material, it costs so much to make those, but who preserves them? What, what are the... Um, procedures for, and processes for preserving them. These are the things that we've worked on and you'll find them uh, in our book uh, and in the e-books. Hadn't been done before, hadn't been looked at before as a, as a group. That was a JISC project. Very exciting, very interesting uh, and very important because having done lots of work on that area, you really need to keep what you've done. And now coming to actual digital archives themselves. The EARC project, which ran from 2014 and finished earlier this year, that was working with national archives. And that's going from complex objects, but really looking at e-government. So most countries across Europe now have some kind of e-government law that says that everything has got to be paperless everything has got to be digital. So all those important records, births, um, parliamentary records, all these things have got to be digital. Now this is a huge bur burden on poor national archives because many of them, the archivists, are historians and they, they do not have the skills or the infrastructure or the tools or anything to preserve all this material. So the EARC project was devised and the impetus actually came from the archives to get together the leading archives and others to provide everything needed for digital archiving across Europe and beyond. And it was beyond because uh, even um, some of the work we did was taken up by NARA, which is the National Archives and Records Administration in the US. So this is really international. We developed tools and standards and as Helen's mentioned, it was a European showcase project. So there are five national archives, Denmark, Estonia, Hungary, Norway, Slovenia, and also some collaboration with the Swedish National Archives. Two, uh, two home offices, the Spanish and the Portuguese. Two umbrella organizations, the DLM Forum and the Digital Preservation Coalition. And the DLM Forum is an organization made up of all the national archives uh, across Europe. And five research institutions. And we worked again on metadata, creating specifications for sharing any kind of digital material. So this has got to work at national level, at international level, at local level. They've got to take account of the fact that different countries will have different legal backdrops. And there's a plethora of different kinds of information. And that's the, what we did had to cover all those different kinds of information. It had to be modular, extensible, so if you've got a small system or a huge system, it's got to work for you. And it's got to be able to cope with databases, things like SharePoint. Now at Brighton, we have a, a SharePoint system uh, for our administration. It's got to be able to cope with things like that, geographical data, simple files, and it's got to be able to cope with anything going forward. Now this is the only technical thing that I've put in from the EARC project. Uh, I thought some, some folk might like something a little technical. At the top here, we have what's called information packages, submission, archival, and dissemination information packages. 
This has come from something called the OAIS system, the Open Archival Information System. That's a worldwide system. METS is an encoding system for transporting material from uh, an organization into an archive or from an archive out to an organization, etc. Premise, this is a standard for preservation metadata. So this is um, who created it, uh, why, what, how, um, everything to do with the, the preservation of your material. These are different archival standards, um, encrypted archival descriptions. And down here, we've got the different kinds of data. So we've looked at um, SharePoint, things like that, ele electronic records management systems, databases. Now, this was a huge undertaking to describe these things that hadn't been described before, but that everybody uses and everybody needs. So we were watched eagerly across the world as we did this work. And down here are all the different kinds of data types that whatever area you work in, you'll find your TIFFs, you'll find your PDFAs, you'll find all your different kinds of objects that we're catering for. And this is a huge area, as you, you can imagine, there is just so much. At the end of the project, we created something called the DAS board, which is the DLM Forum Archival Standards Board, so that what we created in the project will go forward. It won't just be a project that you finish and then you forget, but it's being taken forward. So the standards, the specifications that we, that we created are going forward now, and these are things that we are working on uh, to consolidate, then expand the standards. So the tools and services now, if you go back here, you can see the ERP project website. We have created workable tools. They're there, they're open source, they're mix and match, modular. You can have a whole system. You can fit it with your proprietary system if you have one. Beginner to expert, scalable. It goes up to big data and big data searches. And we have support for organizations in, uh, by means of a maturity model and lots and lots of documentation and a lovely general model as well. So we've covered records. We've covered databases in EARC. We've covered geodata. This is particularly interesting. Um, these were our Slovenian colleagues and they worked with an environment agency who were tasked with preserving um, geographical environmental data, and they didn't know how to do it. So they were delighted when the uh, Slovenian National Archives said, well, would they work with them uh, in our project to create a pilot? So they did that, and uh, that lovely geodata case study and uh, work that they did can now be used by anybody across Europe who has to... Um, comply with something called Natura 2000. Now, there's something called the uh, Inspire Directive, which asks everybody to keep their geodata. So which, uh, which river might be about to flood, uh, which area is one of special scientific interest, this kind of thing. Everybody is tasked across Europe with fulfilling this directive. But agencies didn't have the means to actually archive this data or actually, you know, actually do this, now they can. Other people can actually use what we've done and fulfill their obligations. I can't, in the amount of time I have, convey everything we've done in the project con concerning big data. This little map goes a little way towards doing it. This is looking at voting uh, in Ljubljana in Slovenia from the early 1990s down to 2015 and shows you over time how the voting areas have changed. So this actually, this was a, the result of a, of a big data um, query and here's your result nicely shown. We made use of uh, some open source software called Pelagio, um, Peripleo from the Pelagio project 
which actually looked at distribution of Roman coins and hoards. So all these things work together for the common good um, in various ways, very serendipitous. Now the impact that we've had. Here we have um, the CEO of the Spanish government and the uh, Minister of State the, for the Home Office. And this was a big conference that we gave, um, part of a conference that we gave a year and a half ago. These are representatives of the different regions of Spain. And they were looking at bringing in the paperless office and using what we've done, using our um, e-archiving material. So again, going back to my early talk about uh, digital humanities, I'm interested in things that actually work, that actually make a difference, that people can actually use. That's my particular corner. Down here is a demo day that we did for the European Commission. And there's about 60 odd people in this room from all various departments uh, of the European Commission that had never actually got together to speak to each other uh, on this area before. All, all there and lots of others joining by teleconference to hear about, to see a demonstration of the EOC materials, uh, which will, they'll be using going forward. Now, not content with fil uh, finishing our project, we then were encouraged to apply for something called a building block a Connecting Europe facility building block to support the digital single market. And we did this in the last six months of the project and we're still doing it. What are these building blocks? And this, I hope this is a commission um, slide. Collection of specifications, software and services um, that can be reused in any European project to facilitate the delivery of digital public services across borders. And these are all very much in use, EID, e-signature, e-delivery, e-invoicing, and e-translation. So these are all in use. So we put together a, an e-archiving submission. And this is not like a, an ordinary project. It's not like a, um, an ordinary grant. These are things that the um, member states actually vote on. So we had to spend a lot of time actually speaking to different people and lobbying. And you'll see here, e-archiving came top. So we were voted on by 28 member states. And you'll see here, at the end of our project, there's e-archiving. And we were deemed to be actually deployable. So again, not a project not a blue sky project that everyone will forget and never use again, but actually something that people will take forward and use. Our own national archives, <laughs> we went to visit them uh, a few months ago and there was a huge table full of, of colleagues that had been downloading and testing all that we'd done and getting ready to use it in anger. So these are things that are really going to be used going forward. So this is my research journey. This is where it's brought me. I'm working on other things. Uh, there's a Romore project uh, working on um, research output management and open access repositories with Palestinian universities and something called IRIS, uh, Research uh, Heritage in uh, Infrastructure. But there we are. I think we've pretty much come to our end at the right time. And we are at that nice position of thanking folk. Manfred Taller, I've mentioned, a great inspiration. Ivor Grattan Guinness was my PhD supervisor, sadly no, no longer with us. Tom Bowman James, I've mentioned from the Winchester Project, and Richard, my incomparable colleague. Thank you, Helen for your kind introduction. My family have always been completely supportive. They are wonderful. Uh, my brothers, my children sounds the wrong word, but my children. Friends, supportive, 
colleagues in media, thank you, uh, Julie and Frauke that are here this evening and, and others. Uh, from Serg, thank you to um, Corina, Jamie, Begonia, Dean, Hilary, and John. Thank you. And yes, I started off this evening with a very slight quandary for you, a change of name. This dear gentleman who's in the audience did his inaugural in May, and he ended by proposing to me. Now, I can't follow that. I really can't. But um, there we go. My greatest supporter, encourager, and inspiration. And there we are, getting married on July the 19th. So I say to you, beware if you're going to become a professor at the University of Brighton. You don't know what it might do to you. Well, it did very nice things for me, so I'm very, very happy. And to conclude, may I present Professor Chris Pohl, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, to conclude the proceedings. Well, Janet, thank you very much indeed for that, for a fascinating uh, a, a account. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able... Oh, the picture's changed now, but it's really nice to see that picture because I was doing the same thing at David's lecture as I am this evening, and uh, David just came out, out of the blue with it, I think. And, and, you know, so it's really nice to see that he was as good as his word and that you <laughs> were as good as your word in uh, accepting the proposal and... Uh, uh, and, to, and, to, and to see that, uh, that that photograph was really lovely. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Janet, for, for a, a really uh, fascinating uh, uh, lecture. And I think, um, as with all good lectures, um, it prompts a number of questions. Um, and for me, these 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 questions are about the intersections that that exist between between disciplines, and they go really to the heart of. What do we mean by a discipline? What do we mean by a subject? What are the limits of individual disciplines uh, and, and individual subjects? And does it really matter? Because I think what you've demonstrated is how the application of particular methodologies, but across a wide range of different subjects, and we've heard about history and geography, we've heard about computing, environment, and languages and mathematics and art, and how you apply a set of methodologies across those things. And in doing that, I think you know, what we see emerge um, is, a, is, a, is a, new kind of, a new kind of research, a new kind of knowledge. And it's often that space between disciplines that is the most intellectually uh, challenging and the in most intellectually productive. And I think you've demonstrated that admirably uh, th th this evening. It, it's also been really fascinating to, to see the way in which you, 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 you've, you've woven in your, your own biography here and how that has been uh, important to your work, but also how your work has come to define you in, in, in many respects. And, and, and I, I think that's, that's a really interesting thing that as academics, perhaps we don't give enough time to thinking about and how those two, two, two things really interact with with, with, one, with one another. And I think what, what really you, you, you've, shown, you've shown to us this evening is that in an age where we've got just more and more data, more and more information, that we are all you know, sort of almost drowning in information every, every, every day. But what your work, I think, has demonstrated is that there are ways about, a, a ways in which we can um, preserve the past and the present and to ensure that it becomes part of the future and we learn from it um, and we can advance uh, whatever discipline or whatever disciplines uh, by, by that application of the methodologies that you've spoken about. So thank you very much indeed. Um, it just remains for me to invite you all to join us for a glass of wine through in the, uh, in the reception area out there and to thank uh, once again uh, Professor Janet Anderson.